The Thumble Gadget Podcast, a podcast about ideas, creativity, and innovation. Hello, and welcome to the fourth episode of the Thumble Gadget Podcast. My name is Rich, and I am an engineer. This is the show in which I go out and find creative, innovative people and sit down with them to have a chat about their story. On this episode, I have an interview with a man by the name of Ray Bainbridge. I would describe Ray as an entrepreneur, although having spoken to him, I know that he would describe himself first and foremost as an engineer. In this interview, as seems to have become the norm on this podcast, we covered quite a wide range of topics, everything from the latest high-tech robots through to simply getting a job out of college or university. Indeed, if you're a young person who has a love of technology and want to have a career in technology, then this is definitely an interview you want to listen to. Okay, well, I'm going to start by saying uh, thanks for agreeing to do this, because I know you're <laughs> quite a busy guy at the moment. I guess let's let's start with... Well, I, I know you from some outreach events, and I know that you have an interest in rockets, and also you've got experience yeah. in... You're an entrepreneur, so you work with robot production lines. You've mm. just shown me some very interesting products as well, uh, household products that you're working on. So we'll, we'll get to that, but let's let's start from the beginning. So yeah. where, where did you start? As a creative person, you're an entrepreneur, you own several businesses, but where, where do you start out? when you do that sort of thing well very I, i've always had an interest in engineering um primarily um particularly just technology really ever since a young child watching five Excel five mm. yeah which is even, <laughs> even older than most people tend to, uh, care to mention um so it really started with interest in sci-fi and technology yeah i used to have lego meccano which i actually inherited from my uncle who was actually a, an atomic researcher at Rutherford and Appleton uh, Laboratories uh, back in the early 60s. Um, so I inherited most of his toys for, from a young age. Um, and then when I was about eight years old, I moved to an area in London. And a few doors down from me, I got to know another boy. So it was two eight-year-olds. We were both in the same class at school and so forth used to hang around together. Uh, but he also was very interested in technology and things. And we used to spend our time actually dabbling and creating things. Uh, we'd build simple electric circuits. This is by the time we were about 10. And by the time we were 12, we had our own electric go-kart powered by a starter motor, a car battery, and a mains cooker switch, for which we actually <laughs> got banned from the local park for doing nearly 30 miles an hour in it. <laughs> Um, we, we used to mess around with chemicals and chemistry and create explosives, something you wouldn't want to try these days. Uh, and some of the things really were quite scary, really, that we, looking back at them, I wouldn't want my own children doing them. Uh, but that gave us really uh, an insight into building and making things, really. Hmm. And then when I was 16, uh, I left school, I had a handful of GCSEs or um, which allowed me to get an apprenticeship I got a maintenance apprenticeship hmm. so I was actually a maintenance fitter apprentice I was going to day release college sure and this carried on really um, I finished the apprenticeship and then moved on uh, to further night school to actually do a HNC. So this is all very hands-on stuff. So Certainly, yeah. You like making things, and yeah. from what I've seen, it hasn't gone away. <laughs> no, <laughs> but, uh, it never will. <laughs> hmm. But, um, yeah, so it's so a very practical uh, sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, fr from there, really, I, I sort of carried on the night school thing, uh, I did my HNC and I also did uh, sheet metal and fabrication as well, which involved welding. So that gave me another edge. Um, in my mid-twenties, I was still uh, working as a maintenance apprentice. Well, as, sorry, as a maintenance engineer, you might say. And then I moved over to machine building. Okay. And I stayed in machine building up until I was about 30. I then actually bought... 
couple of retail shops. And yeah, total diversion away I was going to say, that seems a sudden... Engineering, I know. Sudden departure. Yeah, yeah. I thought, what? <laughs> I look back now and think, why? But it did give me a good grounding in the understanding of business, in retail, um, you know, totally different um, aspect of so, business, you might say. So I have to ask, why... You, you say, looking back, it seemed crazy, but you must have had a reason for wanting to do that at the time. Certainly, yeah, at the time, yeah. Uh, we all have, you know, just... There's always justifications at the time as to why we do something. Hmm. Um, but looking back, I can't remember why. Um, I knew I wanted to get, really, I knew I wanted to get into business. Hmm. And I suppose that was the main driving force. I stayed in that business up until I was about 36. I then sold up and thought to myself, what do I really want to do? So I actually went to university full time. Okay. At 36. Sure, as a mature student. Yeah. I was otherwise known as dad to the rest of the class. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> um, I, I carried on, obviously, I, I did the course. I then carried on and started uh, a master's in business information technology. My degree was in mechanical engineering. Sure. And because I'd already had um, previous practical experience, uh, and uh, obviously with already having the HNC, I was able to do the degree in about 18 months. Hmm. And then the master's was in business, tech, uh, was in business information technology, uh, which gave me a good insight into computers. But I'd already built my first computer. In 1982, I built my first computer from scratch just by buying the chips. And Good grief. <laughs> there was a shop in London where you could buy, at Dollis Hill, where you could buy the individual chips. And a company further in London uh, where you could buy the circuit diagrams. Uh, it was for a Triton Trans Am with 4K of ROM and 1K of RAM, and you had to blow your own EPROMs in hexadecimal. So my old friend, whom I still know even to this day, you know, from eight years old, 50 years later, uh, we actually sat there for an entire weekend keying in hexadecimal coding for this computer. <laughs> and at the end of the day, what did we get? We get a couple of lines of code and we can make, you know, a, a, a dot move around on a TV screen. Hmm. So that grounding really gave me a good insight into robotics. Because a year or two afterwards, we'd actually managed to get to a stage where we were connecting stepper motors. So this is about 1983 or so. We'd actually connected to stepper motors, so we were controlling, you know, via a a PC basically. Hmm. Okay, was that what you had in mind when you first got the computer, or were you just thinking, here's something new and interesting, what can we do with it? It was pretty much, it was something new, it was interesting, it was the future, hmm. it was wow, it was different, uh, and it's it, it was cutting edge at the time. Sure, yeah. And that's what's always interested me. I'm just about old enough to remember what computers were, were like. The first computer I had in my house growing up was a BBC Micro, oh. which is probably uh, <laughs> like a Rolls Royce compared to computers back in 1982. But yeah. that that's my first memory of a computer. Mm. And um, looking back now, it, it seems like a crazy primitive piece of uh, mm. machinery. But it's it's you have to remember how far computers have come in a... In a yeah, I mean, when I first started in engineering, um, we we didn't have any computers. Um, most of the, the drawings, uh, well, all the drawings were either done on the back of a cigarette packet, you might say, <laughs> or someone would be there on a board and spend about three months designing one piece of machinery. Mm. Nowadays, um, we tend to spend about a week maybe two weeks designing a machine. 
Hmm. Uh, we quite often don't use drawings. We don't produce drawings, um, and we go straight to uh, straight to manufacture. Can straight to uh, cam, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Quite. Uh... And yet, when we first started, it, I, I, I used to see the guys in the drawing office, and uh, they'd be standing there for months at a time working on the same project. Hmm. Now we'd normally think three months. We'd think receipt of order and delivery for a CNC uh, or a, a you know a robotic cell, you might say, sure, an automated cell. Well, let's. Uh, so we'll come to the the robots in a bit. But you you were mm. talking well, about where things are at the moment, but. You, you were talking about your first attempts at robots, so you had stepper motors and you had uh, mm. driven by this computer. So was that something that you, you turned into a, a business at the time, or where did it go from No, it, it didn't go anywhere at the time. It just uh, became knowledge. Hmm. And knowledge is always useful, even if you don't use it at the time. At some time or other, it will prove useful. Hmm. Or even just giving you an insight as to how things work. Yeah, I mean, my whole creative process really has always been hands-on. Ever since, obviously, this dates back to when I was a child, and that was the only way things were done. And I still do it to this day. I still work on the principle, hands-on. Let's build something. Try it. Does it work? Yes, no, okay, well, let's do some formal drawings for it and design it properly now that we've got a basic prototype. Hmm. But I expect that being a creative sort of person, you, you would rather somebody else followed up on that initial creativity by somebody else did the, the drawing work and the, the development work from there. Yeah, I, I still like to keep a hand in, though, um, hmm. purely because I, I partially feel it's, well, it's my baby, you might say, or my child. Um, <laughs> but I suppose it's because I, I do the initial sort of design concept in my head. And mm. it's, yeah, I, I've got to a stage now where I've done so much 3D work that I work in 3D in my head. Mm. And I design it in my head, you might say, which allows me then to actually build the prototypes. But whilst that it's in the design stage, I'm still thinking, well, how does this work? How does this interrelate? What happens if we do this? What happens if we do that? Mm. Uh, and that is still very much a, a mental exercise rather than a design exercise in terms of you know, a computer design exercise. Sure. Okay. So let's let, let's wind back to mm. you, you've just finished your university course and you've got your, mm. your masters right. yep. in is it business information technology. Yep, yeah. And and where did you go from there? Did you did you know what you had planned next? Uh, I basically ended up working at an engineering company as a design engineer. Okay. Which was my first role in design as design a design engineer. Hmm. Well, what sort of company? Uh, it was a, an automated company um, producing uh, robot cells and automated pick-and-place cells for the car industry. Okay. Um, for which I s still spend a lot of time in the car industry even today. Sure. Uh, from there, I basically then branched out and started uh, my own business hmm. again. And it's purely because I'm not a nine to five person. Hmm. I, I I work long hours, but I I I purely got into my own business purely because I I can't I I seem to be unable to work in a nine to five in an office day in day out. Something I I I just don't seem to be able to want to do. Hmm. I mean, I can work long hours. I can work 60, 70 hours a week sometimes. Sure. Um, but I, I 
I like the flexibility of lifestyle of working for oneself or you know heading up a company whereby I can actually go in do a large amount of work go away for you know x length of time back again but I've always got an interest in what's going on sure but it, uh, it gives you the freedom, I guess, to not be working to somebody else's timetable, but you set the timetable yourself. Mm, yeah. Which is, this is something that um, I think Alan mentioned at one point to me, which is that creative people, one of the worst things you can do is expect them to be the sort of person who's happy to be at their desk at nine o'clock in the morning. Mm. And yeah. I, I can totally relate to, <laughs> yeah, to that. Yeah, I, I just can't. Um, I, the, the creative process as well um it's you can design something that's already got a concept to it but in terms of blue sky thinking um it doesn't happen nine till five yeah blue sky happens out of the blue uh, the latest product happened over a conversation with one of my daughters yeah um and that was probably on a Sunday afternoon or something, or over dinner. Yeah. So it's it's worth mentioning uh, at this point the, the the invention which you've shown me is this very interesting device for growing uh, was it food stuff for well, you intended to be growing food stuff for animals like rabbits or something indoors. Yep. So it's a self-contained unit that you can grow. Um, well. It, yeah, the particular unit uh, was growing wheatgrass. Hmm. Uh, so it's it's young germinated wheat. Um, and it, it is just the wheat grass on its own. There's nothing else in there. There's no fertilizers, nothing like that. It's just the seeds adding some water and adding some light to them in a controlled envi temperature environment. Hmm. Um, and that's purely because we see a potential market for that sort of thing uh, based on purely based on a number of conversations with people hmm. um, so the inventive well your creative process you might say um, it can happen anytime anywhere and it's actually grasping it and remembering and running with it hmm almost carrying a notebook around with yourself. And... Yeah, yeah. Norm most engineers normally actually keep a, a notebook by the side of the bed uh, mm. because there's something called the wolfing hour, which is normally about three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> normally, you, if you've had a design, if you've, if you've become stumped on a design, um, your subconscious brain seems to be ticking away still in the middle of the night. And creation just pops into your head that sort of time of the morning and the the best thing you can do to get a good night's sleep for the rest of the night is to actually quickly scribble it down turn the light back off and go back to sleep because otherwise if you don't you spend the rest of the night trying to remember it hmm. <laughs> so now yeah, that fascinates me i've not quite. I'm, I'm actually a designer, and I've not quite had the same experience with design problems. Although I know what you mean about them, the solutions coming whenever. Mm. But I've certainly had that. I, I do a bit of uh, writing as well, a bit of fiction writing, and mm. quite often story ideas and concepts come to me in that way, and I've I've had to write them down. Yeah. Uh, and often I, I don't end up using them, but they they get stored away, and at some point I might incorporate them. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I, I I do the same thing. I always keep. I've always got a notebook, and I've always got sketches in there. I've mm. got some weird things in there that will never come to fruition, <laughs> um, and other little ideas and so forth that I may one day uh, produce something with. Mm. So, your first business. Mm. So you're working on robot cells. So I'm assuming that that is a setup where there's a robot moving. Was it a pick and place? So, so yeah, uh, these are these are normally something simple like a, a, new, a series of pneumatic uh, cylinders uh, running along guides, uh, purely an X Y pick up product from position one mm. and drop it onto position two. Normally transferring something from say one conveyor belt 
on to another conveyor belt or from one from a one out of a machine onto a conveyor line hmm. or simply stacking items okay uh, um they then got more sophisticated uh, in terms of the work cells and so forth and slowly over the years um got to a stage now whereby uh, much of the uh, design and engineering work now is starting to revolve around things like uh, what they call Yumi robots, which are two-armed robots with built-in vision systems. Okay. So um, it progressed from a very simple, basic pick-and-place unit that could be, say, putting a, um, a lid on a tin through to now something whereby a, a number of components are actually thrown into a cell almost randomly in bins in various configurations but the robot then adjusts itself to actually pick the component up. it's a bit like saying to a young child um you know here's a load of lego random selection of lego pieces and dropping them on the table and saying pick out the red square one okay and the robots now that we're working with have actually got to the stage where it can actually look around and pick out that one, that one particular component, and then actually use that in assembly. Hmm. It's but, getting more and more sophisticated all the time. That's right, yeah. At the moment, though, um, the main cost uh, prohibiting the wide-scale use of these particular robots is... Um, still the equipment that has to go around the robot to present products in a way that the robot can actually handle okay uh, but this is slowly changing and it's it's really a, a software issue now with robots it's not so much a mechanical issue with robots it's now a software issue hmm. and as the software increases um, we'll then find that over the next few years that the robots will come down in price dramatically uh, for for an entire assembly cell. Sure. It's an interesting thing that I... I don't know whether you find this, but when people these days talk about technology, the immediate assumption they make is electronics. You say, say mm. I work in technology, they immediately assume computers, electronics, and so on. Yeah. And the idea of being a mechanical engineer on the cutting edge. Yeah, I, I've almost reach the stage where you know people have asked me oh what do you do and i just say well i'm a, i'm an engineer hmm. because that's what i am at the end of the day it doesn't matter what i do whether i'm sitting in a boardroom sitting in a committee room or whatever i'm still an engineer it still runs through my blood but the trouble is what i find is that a lot of people think oh you're an engineer you mend cars hmm. not i'm trying to actually grade people who mend cars because everybody everybody's job is crucial no matter whether it's somebody cleaning or whatever we're all part of the same cog or sorry we're still start part of the same wheel hmm. uh, and everybody's needed in that wheel yeah absolutely. you can't have one piece missing out of it every every single piece is vital but um in in some ways by being asked by someone actually saying to me oh you meant cars means that they don't really understand what engineers do and unfortunately, then it feeds through to the general population, whereby it's not doesn't seem to be attractive to young people. Yes. Whereas I tend to say more now, I'm a technologist. Hmm. And that seems to then, oh, it's technology. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> when I was in school, uh, some time ago now, but even then... I couldn't, I wanted to be an engineer, I knew I wanted to be an engineer, somehow. Mm. But I couldn't study engineering. I could study design and technology. And the yep. teacher who did that was very much into, mm. um, it was more like arts and crafts with, yep. with, with woodwork sort of thing. Yeah, it's pretty much what I did as well. <laughs> yeah, it was probably the same course, <laughs> even all those years later. <laughs> so so I, I, uh, even up to A-level, I could do maths and physics and I did chemistry as well. But to go and study engineering, mm. I had to wait for university for that. But the other thing, and I'm sure you'll agree with this as well, is that 
and I, I saw a video by this psychologist by the name of Jordan Peterson a while back, and he was saying that when you study creativity, when you look at academia and you look for creativity, you find that there is zero correlation between creativity and grades. Yeah, certainly, yeah. Which is an interesting thing because you can go in and you can get a high grade in engineering, but it doesn't guarantee that you're going to be able to come up with a new idea. Hmm. Which is one of the reasons why I'm interested in interviewing people is um, people who are creative uh, because a lot of people, I presume somebody, a young person listening to this who's maybe in school, maybe doing their A-levels or maybe in university thinking, well, can I go into engineering? Can I go and create something? My grades aren't very good. They, they might not realise that actually they've got a heck of a lot to offer the world that the education system they're in might not recognise. Mm. There, there, is, there is a number of things they can, oh, someone can do outside of school. Uh, most of my, my creative, a lot of my creative skills and engineering from my early years actually came from outside of school. You know, messing around with my, my, old, my dear old friend Colin from 50 years ago. Mm. Um, but nowadays there are so many more opportunities. Uh, there are hack events that people can go along to. There are maker places around the country as well. Places where you can go into uh, that have laser cutting machines. Uh, they have... You know, hack spaces. Yeah, exactly. I'm yep. familiar with them. There's, I think there's one. I think there's one in Oxford near here. I've been to the one in Nottingham. There's, there's one in Wembley Point. We quite often do things with Arduinos, whereby we actually then control pneumatic valves. Mm. We have compressors. We have cylinders. We have things. Uh, uh, one of the, one of the hacks we did was uh, create a pneumatic swing, driven swing. So we had a swing arrangement, and we had an Arduino um, with a couple of pneumatic valves and each end and then the pneumatic valves would then fire hmm. sequentially and create a swing and then we used an accelerometer on there as well so we knew when it was changing was it changing direction uh, these is a number of these places all over the place so if, if something if someone's not getting what they want within the educational system there are alternatives I mean, it would be great if it was inside the educational system. And certainly we've seen with uh, Raspberry Pi. Mm. We've, we've seen various projects being run through that. But outside of that, there are other things as well. That's the thing that I always stress to, to young people if they ever ask me about getting an interesting job is um, if you go for a job, the chances are everybody else interviewing for that job will have the same certificate that you've got. Mm. So what else have you got? That's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and by actually showing that you are um, involved in other activities outside of school shows that you have an interest, a genuine passion mm. for that thing. Uh, and that's what people are really looking for at the end of the day. When, whenever I interview someone, I, I don't look at necessarily their qualifications. It's what they're interested in. Mm. You know, because you want somebody that is, when they turn up into the office and they start work, they're actually there because they want to be, not because they have to be. Sure. Do you find that, do you find that your own understanding of your own ability to be creative guides your own understanding of how to manage the people who are working for you? Um, yeah, I mean, for me, create creating new products new ideas and new bits of design and so forth it's it's where i get my buzz hmm. and i always look upon these things as toys and so i'm still a big kid and so i approach it that way let's have some fun let's have a laugh let's get some pizzas in let's do you know. <laughs> yeah and Everything is just toys, really. They're just bigger toys. You know, whether it's uh, yeah, whether it's yeah, um, a robot. Well, it's, you know, we've all played with robots as kids, but 
well, I've got a big one, you know, I've got a couple of real <laughs> ones, you know, but they're still, it's still like a toy. Wow, can we make it do this? Yeah. Sure. My first business was actually, uh, well, apart from the retail units, uh, hmm. was actually um, in s- space-related products. Uh, well, or rather, which uh, everything from... Um, meteorites which I, I just did in my spare time purely because I still had a strong interest in space hmm. uh, at one stage I was actually supplying the Natural History Museum with meteorites <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I got into it but I, I've always you know, that's another passion of mine there's always been space hmm. you know, I've always taken a strong interest in it everything from rushing home to see the uh, Apollo moon landings you know, from school and watching on a little tiny 15-inch black-and-white TV screen, these fuzzy pictures. Um, yeah, so uh, actually, I, I was actually running that whilst I was actually then working. I was actually an employed engineer. Hmm. Um, so that kept me going. Uh, it was about 20 years ago. Sure. I then, I then got into actually. I, I bought my. I, I started my own engineering company from garage, working in a garage. Hmm. By um, for building jigs and tools, and extruded pieces of metal and so forth. You know, bolting them together. Um, bought myself a lathe. Hmm. I had a small milling machine, pillar drill, that sort of thing, welding gear. Uh, And I was actually still doing that whilst being employed as a design engineer. And then 18 years ago, it will be now, I actually went and started up in engineering properly myself. Okay. I I formed a company uh, with a couple of guys and we started producing a few um, work cells, robot cells and so forth now. Um, uh, and it's, it's, it's something I've, you know, because I've always been interested. I, I, I never stop. I never have stopped. Hmm. But as I say, I, I couldn't do a nine till five because that's not me. Sure. But I'll work all the hours God sends. Um, when would this be? Fifteen years ago now. I, it's so much has happened over the years. It's unbelievable. I, I kept on going in engineering. I, I, I still am now. I, I mean, I've sold various businesses and so forth in the past. I even started an internet company at one time. Um, when quite a few of my friends also got into the internet, and because uh, back in the back in the the no- early noughties, the internet was just really getting going. I, I I happened to get to know quite a few people that hmm. also got into um, the internet, but unfortunately I pulled out, and unfortunately some of my friends made an awful lot of money, and in fact one of my friends made so much money. He actually founded his own rocket company. Um, um, a guy called Mark Rocket of um, Rocket Labs. Okay. He was the original found, co-founder. Uh, but unfortunately, I was with him only down, um, in January down in New Zealand. Uh, unfortunately, I got out of it. I don't know why. Uh, it's because I'd found the next big thing to play with. Hmm. Um. So I've always dabbled in other forms of technology, but always have seemed to get out at the wrong point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because I've always been too impatient and wanted to get on to the next thing. Hmm. Uh, unfortunately, I got out of that and got into rockets way before I should have done, really. Sure. Uh, I, uh, to this day, I, I still do an awful lot of consultancy work for engineering companies. Um, I do a small amount of design work. Um, 
and I'm still into manufacturing as well. Um, just gearing up uh, for nine products that will be coming out over the next sort of four, three to four months, uh, aimed at the domestic market. And for that, we're also then looking at we've lined up a potentially a hundred thousand square foot manufacturing unit within the UK. And our goal is it will all be held within the UK hmm. and manufactured in the UK. Uh, at the end of the day, um, cut me in half and you'll find uh, the Union Jack running through me. Hmm. Yeah. But <laughs> I do get frustrated quite often at the slow pace of government in with engineering and um, particularly with some of the technologies that are coming on now that we've um, we, we've had a dabble in and a hand in. Um, and there are so many changes about to happen within engineering that unfortunately the legislators are nowhere near ready as yet. Hmm. Well, I've got a bit of a libertarian streak running through me and the thing that gives me hope for the future is the way that... Um, Technology seems to be able to advance faster than regulators are able to. Yeah, keep certainly. Up. I mean, when you consider now we're at the stage where within this parliament, self driving cars will be in mass production. Hmm. Within the second parliament, robots or, you know, machines, computers will be as smart as humans. You think in terms of lifetime of a parliament, that's how long we've got. Hmm. And within that time, really, um, we need to change completely our working practice and the way people work. I mean, I, I was I started work in 1975 before the computer revolution. Uh, we used to work a 48 hour week was standard. Hmm. Yeah, sometimes it'd be 44 hour week, but 48 hour week wasn't uncommon. Um, most people I know these days work a, a what, 37 and a half hour week. Some work a 40. Uh, one of my friends fa uh, factory up at Mil uh, to Leicester, he actually still works a, I think it's a 37 hour, it works a 37 hour week, but he, gets all that work done in four days hmm. they're only actually open four days a week the factory <laughs> yeah I, I turned up there one fr I, I found out purely because i turned up there one friday well, and, and all, there was no one there oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah um so uh, the I, I i saw what happened in the 80s i was there i was working during that time and in fact it was actually my old friend Colin, who was one of the engineers that was installing the um, computer systems at Wapping, hmm. uh, which was the first real um, large demonstrations there were against the changes in technology as print changed, changed from the old methods into the, uh, the new manufacturing processes using computers. Hmm. We say print. You mean uh, books and newspapers, newspapers and yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so we we saw all the disruption that went on because we were also engineers at the time. Yeah. Um, and well, I mean, admittedly, now we all have um, well, we're almost at full work. You know, we have very little unemployment, and that's purely due to the technologies and the spin-offs. Sure. But with this next group that's coming along and some of the technologies that I've seen and been involved in, the, the changes are so great um, that we need to have a, a real fundamental change in our, our way of thinking, of working, really. Hmm. Whether it means we go down to a three-day working week and people have two, three-day working weeks, so someone works three days a week and then somebody takes your job for the other three days a week. Hmm. Could We could end up down that route. I'm always amused by the Jetsons 
where George Jetson goes to his office and he mm. works a two day week where he works like two hours or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, but that, that if you extrapolate the trend uh, yeah. that capitalism, I guess, has given us, then mm. then that's what happens. Yeah, the trouble with um, directly with um, a full capitalism system is that we're likely to end up with companies um, or very few people employed. Hmm. So how do we get people to earn money? Um, hmm. It's the big dilemma for the next 10 years. And unfortunately, it's something that the the tail end of this parliament and the beginning of the next parliament, well, certainly our, our, the next parliament will certainly have to deal with um, with driverless cars coming on the roads by then. Oh, a huge amount of employment is... Mm. Uh, is professional drivers. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I mean, a number of the companies that we're dealing with at the moment um, where we're putting in some robot systems, they are actively looking to, um, over the next five to ten years, to dramatically increase their, um, their, their robotics. And certainly I, I, I had a, a meeting with a robot company um, uh, be threat three months ago, and they were predicting a one thousand fold increase in business over the next ten years. That's a heck of a growth. But <laughs> yeah, that's a oh, growth what? <laughs> wow. I guess we should um, to go on to your interest in rockets, mm. because you've sort of explained your your company uh, to me before which is called Tranquility Aerospace. Yeah. Uh, and you, you've also said that you uh, love rockets and space. You always have. Mm. So presumably at some point you had these various businesses going along, but you decided to yourself, I want to start a, a rocket company. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, ever since I was, um, I mean, when I was young, I used to think that I'd end up working designing rockets or something. You know, one of the other things apart from robots, and God, it would have to be oh, it's coming on seven years ago. I basically formed Tranquility Aerospace, which I I, I ploughed some money in from my my um, my work in engineer, you know, from my my robot side, purely with a view to um, well. It was dabbling, really. I wanted to know more. And the only way I could do more is to actually start doing some tests myself. Because we, I, I did some running around within the UK. I interviewed um, a couple of people as well hmm. uh, that had been um, pushing forward some various ideas for, for a number of years related to space planes and so forth um, and rockets. And it certainly it dawned on me, uh, speaking to them, that obviously any funding that's going to have to come or go into rocketry is going to have to come from outside in vast amounts of money. Hmm. I used Tranquility purely as a dabble so I could find out the real costs how much, what technology is that I would need to, or we would need to develop uh, to, you know, create our own machine. What would be the costs? What is the market like? What is the potential market? And uh, set up offices at um, Rutherford and Appleton. Um, probably about this. And had offices there for probably about four years, five years. Hmm. Uh, and during that time, we did various uh, design concepts. Uh, we run a few engines, uh, hydrogen peroxide uh, being the, the chosen oxidizer at the time. It's got a bit of a heritage with British uh, rockets. That's right, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, I think uh, Black Arrow ran on the stuff. But... Yeah, yeah, there's been quite a few, yeah. So... Um, we run a few engines, we uh, investigated navigation systems, landing gear, the possibility of reusability, 
um, tanks, uh, numerous uh, technologies, um, and I really come to the conclusion that at the time when I closed everything that it wasn't quite ready for me hmm. in in the UK. Because uh, we're still waiting on legislation to come into into being, so we can actually fly rockets within the UK. Hmm. And I remember having a conversation a few years ago uh, with a minister, and they were still way years off. They thought from having any legislation for being able to fly rockets within the UK. Now it's very much a case of what comes first, the chicken or the egg. Yeah. Do I invest another couple of hundred thousand in a rocket? Well, you know, uh, for a small launch demonstration launch vehicle, you know, up to uh, this being obviously a couple of hundred thousand because we could do all the, everything in the house ourselves, sure. um, and we've already done all the design work. Or do I just leave it? And at the moment, um, we're still waiting on that legislation. Although, admittedly, the, the, the government's looking at all these places, but vertical takeoff, vertical landing rockets are still very much a mysterious area. Uh, that we've seen recently, thank God, this year, um, a few potential locations. But we, we've gone off and we've um, spoken to a couple of other countries in the meantime hmm. and it's a decision that we'll make probably by about springtime next year in the meantime we will be carrying out some talks with the UK government the latter part of this year about November or December time uh, with with some legal uh, some of our legal team hmm. uh, we'll make a decision then um, uh, but if, if if everything's right, we'll just go hell for leather. Yeah, we we we've we've, um, we've spoken to a couple of universities, a um, couple of other companies. So we thought, well, how about a demonstration rocket? Hmm. Um, unfortunately, academic academic acad I can't even say it. University lead times um, tend to be incredibly long. Yeah, yeah, I can uh, imagine. Yeah, and it's something within I've worked at, you know, being from an industrial background, something I'm not used to. I'm used to very fast turnarounds, very sharp hmm. turns. Um, what can we drive these costs down to? How cheaply can we make something? Uh, and we managed to actually get the cost down of our rocket to around about £10,000. Hmm. And was this was, for a what was this for a this would be a rocket to actually travel to um sixty two miles with a a one and a half kilo payload mm -hmm. admittedly it makes it very tight but as a demonstration and as a, a scientific package to you know to to actually do a a microgravity scientific package. We'd actually managed to drive the cost down that much, purely because in-house manufacturing, we, we've got machines already that can do it. Yeah. Um, you know, lathes and so forth. Um, okay, there are a, numer a number of other costs that go on on top of that, um, such as ground, station, licenses, insurance and so forth. But the actual cost direct cost of the rocket is negligible hmm. compared to all the other costs that are involved. I mean, certainly even for, say, the, the um, Soyuz rocket going into space, yeah. the fuel costs for it are $200,000. So if you make a rocket reusable, a lot of the you know, the manufacturing costs, are, okay, they're quite cheap. Well, you can make them quite cheap, but you can make the whole thing even cheaper. 
but the big cost still is insurance and having the paying for the ground, paying for the land to fly the rocket. Yeah, it's it's suddenly interesting when you look at the breakdowns of this. I've, I've um, Bob Parkinson, who I interviewed last, of course, is, he uh, has done quite a lot of work when it comes to actually calculating the cost of launch vehicles. Mm. And when you start looking at reusable vehicles, it gets very interesting when you see what the real costs are. And as you said, insurance is a significant portion. Mm. Um, you look at a vehicle like Hotel or Skylon, for example, and it's pretty much the same same story. And there are other costs as well, like... Um, an interesting one, actually, when it comes to building the vehicle, because there's if you set up a production line and you only build a small number of these things... Mm and they're reusable, you end up closing the uh, production line and you have a limited number of vehicles. Uh, yeah, uh, th though, um, though there is more to the model than just that, um, because what you then do is you use the same production line and the same engine, but you build a bigger rocket. Okay, yeah. So that then leads you on to a... and. Uh, and a reusable rocket will only be useful for, say, 10, you may get 20 flights out if you're really, really lucky. I mean, OK, we're, we're a long way from that as yet. Um, but you'll still need to manufacture. But because you bring down the cost, potentially you increase demand. Hmm. And therefore, then there's more demand for more rockets. Sure. And this is the, uh, I imagine, the interesting thing there is trying to convince backers that there will be the market once you've opened up the mm. frontier, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Which is why, really, um, our goal and our model is keeping it all in in house. Hmm. Um, getting backers for rockets is hard. This is a very risky business. Okay, um, modern modern rockets have a really good um, success rate. They run about ninety seven percent success rate. Um, even SpaceX is still managing to even their first few rockets. They're still running at um, ninety five percent success rate. Sure. Which for an expendable launch vehicle is is reasonable. Hmm. Certainly want it to be better. You've reminded me of a line that Bob Parkinson came out with, which is that how how do you make a millionaire in the launch vehicle business? And the answer is you start out as a billionaire. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I I wouldn't be. Uh, yeah, the, the partially the reason for um, the rocket thing is it is an interest. Hmm. It's something I won't make money at. And I doubt I ever will make money at it if we go for it. Sure. It will be very borderline. But it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's what I enjoy. Yeah. Which is... Uh... It comes back to big boys and big toys. Whereas we were small boys and small toys. Now we're big boys with big toys. Which is what engineering is all about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we, we've already sort of covered this, uh, but the thing that I really care about with this, this uh, podcast is creativity, yeah. but mm. also trying to um, give young, young people who are mm. starting out uh, an insight into where they should be going when they make their minds up and almost not to get disillusioned. It's very easy to come out of university with an engineering degree, go into a big company mm. and get stuck in a, an, an analysis job or something and to become disillusioned with the whole business of, of creating new things. Certainly. I, I'd advise anybody who wanted to get into engineering is work for a small company. Hmm. If you work for a small company, you'll see so many different aspects of engineering very close up. And you will probably be, you know, not just set as one job, just analysing something or just designing one little aspect. You will be involved in a much wider range of products. 
And you'll also be able to see a lot more other disciplines at work as well, close up. Hmm. Um, I, yeah, I mean, you spoke about, you said degree. Um, I, mean, I didn't have a degree when I got into engineering. I mean, sure. there's, there's not only that, because I mean, it, there's, you don't have to be that academically inclined to get into engineering. I mean, there are plenty of other opportunities in terms of apprenticeships um, or even starting as I started as a fitter. Yeah. You don't have to necessarily start at a certain level. Yeah, I, I certainly agree that apprenticeships are a really good way to, mm. especially if you, you know that getting the grades isn't your, your strength, but you, you are very good with your hands and you mm. can... A very practical person. Well, but we, we we see you see the same mistakes though with um, in students or the engineers you might young engineers that come out of university. You've seen the same mistakes time and time again, whereby because they haven't had the practical skills, quite often they've designed something. You think, well, okay, how do I get an Allen key in there? Yeah, how do I tighten that up? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, and those are some of it that come with practicality, really. Mm. Because you then start thinking about, well, someone's got to take this apart. Someone's got to build it. Mm. How should I get this? How do I get my spanner into that place? Uh, and the practical aspect is, is just as crucial as the theoretical. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd, I'd certainly say to anyone, you know, well, you know, there's apprenticeships, there's other forms, there's college, HNCs, ONCs, so start there. Hmm. And you can always work your way up later. There's always evening classes, there's always uh, open university. And I guess the other thing that's worth mentioning as well is you have to be, I'd say to anybody young these days, going into university, you have to be really sure that you're going to use that degree. That degree is going to be value to you because the amount that you're paying for it these days. Mm. Yeah, I was, I was fairly lucky. I was one of those ones that um, got in just before fees started happening. And in fact, I actually got paid by the government to go to university. Mm. <laughs> I was quite mm. lucky. I only had a very small loan I had to take out, uh, which is... Thankfully, paid off now, but I'm aware mm. of people leaving university now may never pay off for that. So, yeah, I, I mean, I've got one daughter that's got a, a debt of um, 25,000. A lot of the students, I, I do a lot with um, quite a few universities. I set projects for them um, mm. for master's students, um, small engineering projects uh, for them for their final, you know, for the final, pro um, final part of their course. And yeah, I talked to some of them. They talked about debts of forty thousand pounds. Good grief! <laughs> yeah, um, what? And it's not just that because mm. it's the opportunity cost of the money that you could be earning if you were in a in a job, even mm. if it was a relatively yeah low paying one. Yeah. So in some way, in some ways, it's almost worth having an apprenticeship and do it paying night school. Hmm. Because uh, at least then you've got a steady income and you won't end up with a debt at the end of the day because you would have paid for it as you've been going along. Yeah, yeah. You said you were on day release. Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did day release um, after my apprenticeship finished. I actually did my um, my HNC in evening classes, three evenings a week, mm. six till nine, and it's during winter. <laughs> Worst time of the year in the country. <laughs> it's already dark when you go there. Yeah, and, yeah. Dark, dark when you go there. Dark when you come out. <laughs> Why not during the summer? <laughs> so I, I guess the message we've got here is that maybe not. This don't necessarily take university as a given. But the other thing is, you say go to a small company. Mm. So. Now, something that my experience of young people is, is that they're quite, not many of them are very good at going on their own initiative and finding potential employers. I know I certainly wasn't. I, I got very lucky. I got on a graduate scheme mm. at university. 
and it worked out very well for me. But in terms of, because you, you've never had to go out and do something like that for yourself before, as a young person, mm. or at least most young people haven't, it's, it's hard to get into the mindset of, this is what I want to do with my life. This is the sort of career. I want to work for a little company, mm. maybe, or I want to go and do this. How do I find somebody who will take me on? Or how do I go and find those companies? Uh, certainly, I mean, one thing I'd certainly say is go along to engineering trade exhibitions. Mm. Um, you'll find an awful lot of companies there. And also give you an idea on the sort of technologies that are around and are being manufactured. Mm. Uh, there are machine tool exhibitions you can go to. Uh, so at the NEC, oh, it, it, these are vast exhibitions covering a, a number of halls. There are robot exhibitions, industrial robot exhibitions you can go along to. Go along to these places. They are, you get a catalogue with a database with all the companies in there. And you can walk around the stands, you get an idea and a feel for their technologies that they manufacture. And you may walk down one aisle and think, wow, that's cool. Mm. Wouldn't mind working for that company. We already know who that company is then because there's their stand. Mm. You can speak to the people on that stand. Where are they based? What do they do? Mm. And I guess part of it is being a little bit cheeky as well, I expect, and, and asking, are they taking on apprentices or do they have a graduate scheme? That's, or? that's not being cheeky. You don't ask, you don't get. Sure. It's It's not, it's... People are quite happy to talk to you at the end of the day hmm. because if you've shown a passion in something, an interest in something, it's an interest in them. It's an interest in what they do. Hmm. There'll be more than nine, nine out of ten you'll find they'll be more than willing to help you in any way they can. Yeah. And particularly as a lot of engineers we know, there is a huge gap currently in. Um, in engineering in the UK. I, I see it in a number of companies I, I know and I go into and I work with, whereby you see a large clump of engineers all in their early 60s, well, in their 60s and in their late 50s. And we were all the Apollo children. We got into engineering because of the Apollo. Mm. There's then a huge gap. You, you look around in an engineering company and you will see very few people in their 40s and even less so in their late 30s. The next group you'll see really will be in their, either they're quite young in their early 20s up to about 30. Okay. And there's this huge gap in between. and Sort of oh, the Google generation almost. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's a huge gap in between. Unfortunately, that was during the 80s and the noughties when, you know, people, oh, well, we'll become a service industry, service country. Hmm. Uh, engineering wasn't cool. And unfortunately, it never really paid well. Unfortunately, well, at the moment, it pays incredibly well because there is such demand, there is a total lack of skill, and engineers now are... are, are good qualified engineer is earning some really good money hmm. most most university graduates will go in mid 20s um, by the time they're sort of late 20s they'll be earning 40 odd thousand a year hmm. of course when you get to wrinkly ages my my sort of age then it becomes silly money really hmm. but it's yeah, it's it's a worth it's a worthwhile career and will give you a good standard of living these days. Yeah, the thing I found I, I've given uh, outreach talks to uh, quite often to young people, but to, I, I gave a talk to a, a group of uh, older you know, engineers in the aviation industry. Mm. They're mostly uh, small company owners, actually, and they're saying the biggest problem they had was finding trained engineers. Yeah, yeah, uh, and and competent engineers, and it. By that, I don't necessarily mean graduates, because somebody who comes straight out of university, they might feel they're qualified, but they haven't had any practical experience. Mm. Uh, this is the interpretation I've had, and this is why companies have graduate schemes. But try if you're a university graduate, and you're thinking, okay, well, I'd love to go and work for a small company. 
it can be they're looking for an engineer with several years worth of experience so i don't know trying to bridge that gap might be something yeah i, I, I know a number of companies these days that they know um that there is a shortfall and they they uh, they know it's hard to get engineers, and a good engineer is expensive. Hmm. So, a number of companies I know these days are actually the smaller companies, are certainly taking on young engineers, knowing that they do require training. Yeah. Um, but with software these days, um, three dimensional designing, and with correct processes. Hmm. and correct design reviews um, then you know those en engineer those young graduates are able to contribute quite well to companies very quickly yeah yeah i can understand that well wow, excellent well, i guess that's as good a point as any to um hmm. to the okay. interview so it's, it's been very interesting um a romp through your your past but also cr the creative process and um and a message to young engineers as well. Yeah, so, sure. So thank you very much. That's all right. No worries. That's all for this episode of the Thumber Gadget Podcast, episode four. I've made a promise to myself that when I get to five episodes, I'm going to organise some hosting and get this up on iTunes. In the meantime, you know the drill. Like, comment, subscribe, and share this podcast with anybody you think might be interested. Every little helps. And I'll see you next time.